We are four racers into what is turning out to be an enthralling Donaldson Cross Country Motor Racing Championship. And it's not only men that brave the dirt and dust, but a few women too that continue to make their mark in the sport. A number of rookies get strapped into a few racing cars for the rides of their lives courtesy of Atlas Copco. We take a sneak peek of what it really takes to compete at the highest level as a privateer team. We pay homage to the unsung heroes of the sport, the ones who sit in the other seat of the race car. Celebrities that are famous for their exploits in their own worlds get to taste a bit of ours. And we look forward to paying a visit to arguably the prettiest event of the season down in Malilan. Welcome to another episode of Inside Cross Country, your sneak peek and behind the scenes exclusive of what it is that makes the Donaldson Cross Country Motor Racing Championship one of the most exciting forms of motorsport on the planet. The scores of drivers and navigators, together with their dedicated teams and technicians, descended upon the northwest town of Freiburg on April Fool's Day, of all days, to kick off the 2016 title fight with the season opening RFS Endurance Race. But before we continue, here's a very quick rundown of what the cars are that make up the Donaldson Championship. There are two distinct categories that have their own separate races and championship, but they do happen to share the same race course on the weekend and at the same time, this adding to the overall spectacle for the fans. On the one hand, there are the purpose-built off-road racing machines that will look at home on any sci-fi movie set. These monsters are called special vehicles and consist of Class A for the highly powerful two-wheel drive race cars that sport engines over four litres in capacity. And the cars competing in the Class P of the special vehicle category are limited to four litres maximum. The rest of the field consists of production vehicles, still purpose-built racing machines, but designed to resemble cars that can be purchased from any Volkswagen, Ford, Toyota or Nissan showroom which is why we have Amarox, Rangers, Hiluxes and Navaras competing in the championship. Class S is for production vehicles with engines up to 4 litres. Class T though is where most of the action takes place as it's the fighting ground for most of South Africa's premier teams with cars up to 5 litres. And the Class FIA, as the name suggests, is the class where the cars compete in the same spec as they would do on any FIA sanctioned cross country event, such as the FIA World Cup. They have independent suspension all around and specialized racing tires. After 700 kilometers of dusty and dry gravel roads near the northwestern town of Freiburg, it was indeed the two FIA spec Toyota Gazoo Racing SA Hiluxes of Leroy Poulter and Rob Howie and Anthony Taylor and Dennis Murphy that reigned supreme by taking their first one two of the season. A great victory by young Jason Fenter and Vince Van Allemen in their 4x4 Mega World Toyota Hilux set up a great title fight with the older and more experienced crews in the Class T's. Redline Racing's Johan van Staden ended up second with former champion and local hero Chris Fisser ending third in his Neil Woolridge Ford Ranger this year, partnered by Ward Huxtable. And that was only the half of it. In the special vehicle fight, it was Willem de Toy and Baptist Gussard who came out on top over former champions John Thompson and Morris Sir Mutton in Class P, while current champions Evan Hutchison and Danny Stassen started the year with a bang thanks to an impressive victory in their motorized bat. Big man Sorrel van Bolyun and Navi Philip Herselman crossed the line in second position, just ahead of a career best third place for the Sutus, Keith McInetti. They say that a meteorite hit the town of Fredefort some 2,000 million years ago, but we reckon that was nothing compared to what happened on Saturday, 7 May 2016. That was the date of the first ever Fredefort Super Sprint, held on the outskirts of the town with the same name. At only 200 kilometers in total distance, it was a shortened and more compact, but no less exciting form of cross-country motor racing. This meant pedal to the metal from the word go, 
which is exactly what Toyota Gazoo Racing SA's Leroy Palter did. The man is on form following his exploits at this year's Dakar Rally and it showed once again as his Hilux was the first to cross the finish line after 200 kilometers of flat out racing. Class T for South African spec production vehicles was a battlefield, this time with two NWM Fords making it onto the podium. Chris Fisser was the first to cross the line with teammate Gareth Woolridge in third and the RFS Volkswagen Amarok of Christian Ducloy the meat in the Ford Ranger sandwich. Former champions Quinton and father Cully Solwald returned to cross-country racing in Friedefort and were immediately rewarded with a fine victory in a special vehicle category, just ahead of Jimmy Zahos and Stefan van Pletsen. And it was a first ever victory for Werner Kennedy and navigator Tina Spencer in Class P and a maiden win for the Century Racing CRT vehicles too. From Freiburg and Friedefort, it was time to cross the border and head into Botswana for the biggest event not only on our calendar, but also the single biggest sporting event that country has to offer. It is also known as the most iconic motor race on the continent, and it's officially called the Toyota Kalahari Botswana 1000 Desert Race, and as always, the 2016 edition was epic. Not only did tens of thousands of fans come out to witness the spectacle, but at a thousand kilometers through thick desert sand spread out over three full days, the race also lived up to its fearsome reputation, truly testing the many crews that were brave or stupid enough to take it on. In Class P of the Special Vehicle category, John Thompson and Marie Samat not only took on the desert, but also came out on top, showing that experience counts for much in the world of cross-country racing. In Class A, Australian Dave McShane with South African Leander Pienaar beside him put his experience to good use to win his first ever motor race on African soil behind the wheel of the Fox Racing Porter. Sorrel van Bouillon occupied the second step of the podium with Cobalt Racing's Jimmy Zahos spraying the champagne from the third step. Over the production vehicle end of the desert race, it was Red Line Racing's Luke Wurter and co-driver Andre Vermeulen who put in a solid drive to cross the finish line as the third fastest crew in Class T. Ahead of Wurter, the race and title fight raged on between rivals Chris Fisser in his Neil Woodridge Motorsport Ford Ranger and the 4x4 Megawool Toyota Hilux of youngster Jason Fenter. On this occasion, Fenter got the better of Fisser, claiming the win. Long and difficult events like this one are exactly what the Toyota Gazoo Racing SA Hiluxes were built for, and it showed once again. The team featured no less than three of their Dakar and FIA class cars in Botswana, and also proved that the sponsor isn't always cursed, as their three cars were also the first cars to cross the finish line of the Toyota Kalahari Botswana 1000 Desert Race. Polter made it a full house with another victory over teammate Anthony Taylor, whilst former teammate to Sebastian Loeb, Zimbabwean Konrad Rattenbach and German co-driver Dirk von Zietzewitz completed the podium. From Botswana, the Donaldson Championship crossed back over the border and returned to familiar territory, the Northwest Province, for the Lichtenberg 450. It was late in July in an area that is hugely affected by the drought, so the racing was dirty and dusty, to say the least. And after not finishing the desert race the month before, Evan Hutchison got his season back on track with a dominant Class A special victory in Lichtenberg. Second position was a career best for father and daughter Kutsia and Sandra Labaskakni in the 4x4 Mega World Porter, whilst Australian Dave McShane stood on yet another special vehicle podium. Behind them, John Thompson again took command of Class P ahead of Guy Henley and Andrew McInetti. In the production vehicle battle, and more specifically Class S, Yanni Fisser returned to his winning ways ahead of the two Graven brothers, Otto and Ronnie. Luke Berta continued his good form when he reached the Class T podium for the second event in succession, whilst the Atlas Copco Volkswagen Amarok of Gary Bertolt and Jeff Minnett recorded their best ever finish with a fine second. And once again, it was the 4x4 Mega World Toyota Hilux of Jason Fenter and Vince Van Allemen who stole the show, doing the young man's championship aspirations no harm at all. And as with all the races before, Leroy Poulter and Rob Howey continued their winning run by crossing the line in first position once again, ahead of Toyota Gazoo Racing SA teammates Anthony Taylor and Dennis Murphy. 
Redline Racing's Terence Marsh, this time partnered by celebrity singer Kurt Darren, completed the FIA podium. So those were the standings following four tough rounds of the Donaldson Championship. Join us after the break for more behind-the-scenes action from the Donaldson Cross Country Motor Racing Championship. This week on Ignition GT, Honda's slick new Civic debuts in SA and it's every bit as good to drive as it is to look at. In typical Honda tradition, it's well specced and brilliantly engineered. Audi launches a baby crossover with a character all of its own. According to Audi, the wide track, short overhangs and excellent weight distribution endow the Q2 with a go-kart feel. And we sample the VW Golf GTR Club Sport in its natural environment. I like what they did with the rims. It's not yeah. your standard GTR rims. That's Ignition GT this week on DSTV Channel 189. Names such as Evan Hutchison, Leroy Poulter and Anthony Taylor have become famous because of their title-winning exploits behind the wheels of their race cars, supported by the factories and the big sponsors. And rightfully so. But it's on the other side of the designated service park where you'll find the true heroes of the sport. These guys don't have the pressure of answering questions in a boardroom full of accountants on a Monday morning. Instead, they do it for the pure passion and love of the sport. And no one loves it more or has done it longer than cross-country racing stalwart Wolf Peter Fumfe. First off, I'm racing for 43 years. Second, I built my own cars. So basically, it's, it's quite fun to be alone because whenever you make a mistake, nobody can blame you. You can only blame yourself. I don't do test drives at home because I live in a town. You check all the wiring, the lights and all that. So basically the car uh, fixed itself. I built 23 cars. Before that I had to buy it. My knowledge wasn't big enough. Okay. So whenever I drove a car for a year, then I sell it end of the year. The car next to us, I built as well. Okay. And there's another two here. So basically, it's a paid hobby for me. But whereas Fumfai prefers to have all the fun to himself in his single-seater Sandmaster, others go out of their way to make it a family affair. Father Kutsia Labaskakni enjoyed his best ever result in Lichtenberg with his daughter Sandra sitting alongside him when they finished the race in second place in Class A of the Special Vehicle category. And in the same class, it's hard not to see the bright PHB bat of Marius Ferri and his wife Yulinda doing the job of keeping him on the straight and narrow. When it comes to regional cross-country racing, there are even more ladies playing in what used to be a man's world. Model Lila Ladham can be seen strutting her stuff next to Rikus Prinsler in the number P30 Zarko, while Zalma Beer is another example of a wife that shares her passion with husband Andrew. But no lady has made quite the same impact in 2016 cross-country racing as Suma Smith. Not only is she the one behind the wheel of the Hunky Pallets number P81 Zarko, but her business Hunky Pallets is also a major series sponsor for the Northern Region's cross-country championship. The sponsorship money is used to subsidize the entry fees for all the other competitors, providing that it's possible to put a lot back into the sport that so many people so dearly love. So the sport of cross-country racing is spreading its wings far and wide. But even so, the thrills and exhilaration that accompany this adrenaline-filled sport is only available to the select few. Or is it? Well, we're out here on this beautiful South African sunny day at Girotech, about to take some of uh, Atlas Copco's corporate guests on a crazy ride. Let them experience this VW Amarok this Dakar spec car at its best and uh, we're going to give them a, a ride in the Amarok as well as in the uh, bat and show them exactly what we do and what it's all about and uh, everyone's going to hopefully have a fantastic day.
<laughs> awesome. <laughs> now that I have been through it, I wouldn't mind doing it over and over again. Uh, uh, shake your hand, but hell, it's brilliant. Than any roller coaster I've ever been on. <laughs> it's phenomenal. I can't compare it to anything. The most unreal experience. Let's go again. <laughs> you can't believe I can't do that much. Alright, what a ride. Just want to go again. Bye bye. Like as you can see. But I different respect for these guys. I thought it would be so scary, but I enjoyed it. It was great, it was quite an experience. I'll be like a dog, I'll be back in there now. <laughs> Join us after the break for more insight into the world of cross-country motor racing. Welcome to the East London Grand Prix circuit and the Extreme Festival making their way down to the Eastern Cape yet again. Big crowds coming out to support this. Good to see all these guys and girls coming out to support the Extreme Festival. It's what it's all about. You've got to get you to enjoy all the action that happens not only on track but off the circuit as well. This is Ingenuity. In this episode, Evoc Underground, Jay Leno drives Jaguar to victory, and action at Le Mans. Welcome back to Inside Cross Country, where we take you behind the scenes of the 2016 Donaldson Championship. So far, the 2016 season has been dominated by the factory Toyota Gazoo Racing SA squad, and more specifically Leroy Poulter and Rob Howie, who has won every event in their FIA and Dakar specification Hilux. But if it's close racing that you're after, then look no further than the battle that's currently raging in Class T. It's a battle fought by race cars from no less than five manufacturers, including Toyota Hiluxes, Volkswagen Amarox, Nissan Navaras, Ford Rangers, and one BMW X3. Currently ahead of the fight is Jason Fenter in the 4x4 Mega World Hilux. We caught up with the young man's father and team principal, Dion Fenter, during the recent desert race to get a feeling for what it takes to compete at the highest level as a large privateer team. We're probably one of the bigger uh, private teams. Um, we've got the car in basically every class. We have a, 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 our premium class, the T-Bucky with Jason in it. Then we've got Heine Strumper in the class S. And then uh, this race here, I'm, I'm in a class A vehicle myself. Um, we come to win. It takes a lot of dedication from a staff and um, a lot of de uh, dedication from the technical team because uh, after a race like this, the cars are a piece of thing. They like rebuild the car, like you saw this morning. We've got about 15 guys on the car, um, some permanent staff, some staff that we hired just for the desert race, but all the best that you can get that don't work for factory team are here. Every race we, we're running at about 400 litres of fuel. Um, per car, uh, tyres, we've been lucky, we've only had two punches out of the three cars, so um, not too bad on tyres. We come out here, we come out with a, a truck and trailer, a horse and trailer, that carries the cars and it's got all the spares, enough to build, rebuild both cars, or all three cars, and then we come out with a, a bus to bring the staff out with, and then we have a, what we call a chaser car which keeps us, keeps us all in where the cars are, what's happening to the cars. It's got um, communication with all the racing cars at that stage. That's a chaser car with two staff members in just keeping control of the whole race. So, um, and then from our sponsors, it takes a lot of money to keep these cars going and to compete against the factory teams. It's a big marketing tool. I mean, myself from Mega World side is, we couldn't pull out because the marketing is so good in, in it. And people like Cooper Tires, I mean, it's a premium brand at a premium race and it's um, showing how good their products are. Someone who also knows all about running a large team is Ford's Neil Woolridge of Neil Woolridge Motorsport. Over a career that spanned decades, the man from Maritzburg has quite literally seen it all. From winning championships as a driver to taking both his sons to the highest level. But not even that could prepare him for what happened just days before the recent race in Lichtenberg. 
it's an absolute disaster. You know, I was, as I said, I was away in Spain at the time. I got a call from Lance, my son, to say, Dad, the factory's on fire, the cars are burning. And uh, I can't describe the feeling that you get. It's just, you feel sick. It's like, it's almost like someone's joking, you know. Anyway, I went to bed and woke up the next morning thinking this is like a dream, you know. And immediately, I just wanted to curl up in a ball and just sort of say, well, that's it. I can't do any more, you know. We've, it, you know, it's, life is difficult enough anyway. Finding finances and all that is really difficult. To have the whole factory and, and both cars just destroyed was soul destroying. And I thought, well, I'll just come home. You know, I'll come home early, get an earlier flight back from Spain. But by the time I did that, I would have got back a day early and missed the race there anyway, so I stayed. I think in retrospect, probably the best thing to do because we had a good result. So I came back with a bit of a spring in my step to get to the factory on Monday evening to physically see for myself. And that's when I sort of jumped back into my, my hole again. You know, it's just smoke and just black and just absolute mess. You know, totally destroyed machines, the building, everything. Just absolute devastation. So, um, but what do you do? You've got to pick yourself up and go again, you know. So, fortunately, everybody has been unbelievable. Uh, our opposition, Toyota, everybody. People overseas from Brazil, our customers, our friends, the... the the camaraderie that we've experienced is second to none. So immediately we responded to Corbus and his son Jacques at uh, Unifreight and said, guys, can you help us out? And without a hesitation, they said, yes, come pick up the car. So we drove up to Harrismith, got the car over the weekend, took it back to the workshop. The guys worked day and night for three days to, to try and get it up to where we should be with the car. And here we are today. So unbelievable story. The four teams' efforts did indeed allow former champion Chris Fisser back into the title fight. But what about the men and women sitting on the other side of the car? Some call them navigators or co-drivers. We call them the unsung heroes of the sport. And this is why. Well, we get up in the morning, we make sure that we've got the right uh, liquids on board, make sure we've got the right paraphernalia to help us uh, guide us on the route in terms of route schedule because I will need the root schedule, my ODOs and the GPS system to function together in order to be able to tell my driver where to go accurately. The book takes preference. I then will look at the pictograph. It will tell me which direction we're going to travel. It will also tell me the distance to that point. I will then reference that to my odometer to know when I've arrived at that point. Once we've made the, made the call, I will then reference it back to the GPS to make sure that there hasn't been an error. The GPS is simply there as a, as a backup. Okay, this, if I can use this as a reference, this particular, this particular picture is telling me it's going to be a hairpin right at, at 1.54 kilometers, and that will be the total distance into the route. I will then, depending on the speed at which we're traveling, I will call that in from anywhere between 350 and 150 meters. Depending, if, we, if we're traveling very fast, I'd call it early to give the, the driver time to break. Okay, this one here would be at 700 meters, 90 right, followed immediately by a 45 right. And usually this distance here would be known. If I had to look at the scale of the book, I would suggest to you that that's 100 meters. So I'd call it 90 right, followed immediately by medium right, 100 meters. We have two sets of odometers. What we use one simply as a backup. I use the right hand one to measure the total distance and then I use the bottom odometer to measure intermediate distances between poles. If this happened to fail, I'd then reference that one. On the GPS, the little picture of the car would travel along the thick yellow line. Um, you can actually clearly see from the, from the screen which way is facing forward and I would make sure that the car was always on that line. If you get into an area where the, the track is not clear, you might be in heavy dust. You can then ask the driver to go further left, further right, where you actually can't reference physically yeah. outside the car. You can just make sure the picture of the car is on the track. So, a rather complex business, this thing called navigating. Imagine then being pulled from your comfort zone and getting strapped into one of these V8-powered monsters with a road book on your lap. Well, this is exactly what redlined racing does to celebrities who are brave enough to take on the so-called celebrity challenge, navigating a full race alongside Terence Marsh in the redlined racing Nissan Navara. 
His recent victims included the carte blanche icon Derek Watts and popular singer Kurt Darren. An incredible experience. It really has been something that uh, is hard to describe to anybody. Even as a carte blanche presenter, we can't describe it. It is just too much for the mind. It really is. I can't um, deny that I was counting the case towards the end, um, mainly because I just wanted to finish, you know, but it has just been one of the most amazing experiences of my life. The scale of the sport I never imagined. I mean, look at what goes along with these vehicles. I thought it was going to be Terence and myself and a tent. I seriously did. But with all these teams, it's just incredible. And the teams themselves, I mean, these guys here had to fix the diff last night till midnight, had to put another shock on. So it's, it's a team sport, it really is. It's a team sport and a wonderful camaraderie, hey? Although there are some drivers I want to report to Carp Lodge. <laughs> I won't give any names. <laughs> Unreal experience, you know. It's, but it was awesome, really had so much fun, you know. It was, got much respect for the sport now, you know. I don't think I know what these guys go through. And, the, and uh, also on the field, you know, it's crazy. For me, it was just awesome, you know. I've done a lot of adrenaline stuff before. This, I think, tops the kind of thing. I've dived with sharks, all that kind of stuff. Skydived and anything, but this is a it's a different vibe, you know. I think you really got to trust the person that's driving, you know. And I, I knew I met Terence yesterday, first time, but I trusted him, and he pulled us through. Eh? Yeah. Next in Marsh's sights is top SA television and radio personality Kluby Umboya when the Donaldson Cross Country Motor Racing Championship reaches what is arguably the most scenic event of them all, the Nkomazi 450 in Malalan. The race will once again be contested in the Salati sugarcane fields on the outskirts of the Kruger National Park. It's also the hometown of the Horn Brothers, who will be eager to perform, and if last year's spectacle is anything to go by, cross country racing fans will once again be in for a treat. See you all in Manalan on the 26th of August. Inside Cross Country Action was brought to you by Donaldson in association with Force Fuel, Ford, Toyota and Tire Rack.